Sorry, I didn't see you there. I was just listening to the classic Midwest emo album American Football by the band American Football on cassette. What is Midwest emo? Where did it come from? Who is the first Midwest emo band? In this video, I'm going to answer all those questions as I take you through the history of Midwest emo. I was thinking of how I could briefly explain and sum up Midwest Emo, because there's a lot of Midwest Emo content out there. It's even become a meme. So the- Hey, hold on. I'm not gonna let you do this alone. Um, who are you? Who am I? Isn't it obvious? I'm Midwest Emo Mike. Okay. Don't worry, I'm only here to help. Think of me as your emo best friend. Your Midwest emo best friend. <sighs> this is going to be a long video, isn't it? Before we dive into Midwest emo, we need to briefly talk about where the word emo comes from. The first time the word emo was ever used was in 1986 in Thrasher magazine. The label of emo core was used to describe the new sound of bands in the Washington DC scene, bands like Embrace, Rites of Spring, and Beefeater. At first, people didn't really embrace the word. Pretty famously, Ian Mackay of Embrace, Minor Threat, and Fugazi said this during an Embrace show in 1986, right after the emo core edition of Thrasher magazine came out. I must say, emo core must be the stupidest effing thing I've ever heard in my entire life. As if hardcore wasn't emotional to begin with. And that's where the word emo comes from. But what about Midwest emo? While early emo bands Embrace, Beefeater, Rites of Spring, and Moss Icon all had pretty clear punk rock roots, Midwest emo bands would add a melodic sound to emo that would define an entire decade. The first Midwest emo band was Chicago's Cap and Jazz, releasing their one and only album in 1995. If we take a look here... Now hold on, that's not exactly true. What do you mean? Look at that album title. It's pretty emo. Even the board says so. You know, that is pretty emo. But that doesn't change the fact that Cap and Jazz are not the first Midwest emo band. Gage from Chicago, Friction from the Chicago suburbs, and Sideshow from Nebraska all predated Cap and Jazz. And it's also a very fun fact that Bob Nana, who was the lead singer in Friction, would go on to be in prominent Midwest emo bands Braid and Hey Mercedes. But don't you worry, we'll get to that a little later. Did you know there's a post from Reddit about an artist named Fernando Cabrera? He released music in 1984, and some of the guitar work on those songs sound exactly like twinkly Midwest emo. That's got to be the nerdiest thing you've ever said. Okay, so while technically not the first Midwest emo band, Cap and Jazz was the first Midwest emo band to make an impact. The emo subreddit has a very good definition of Midwest emo. Midwest emo is a style of emo that originated in the early 90s that takes from the song structure and occasional vocal style of previous emo bands but imbues it with more melodic sensibilities and broader influences. Bands started to experiment more with loud soft dynamics, intricate melodies, heavy buildups, and twinkly guitar work. At the core of these bands lies a commitment to the DIY ethic and an embrace of sincerity. I also found this description from the Midwest emo fandom wiki. The low budget DIY roots of the genre heavily influence both the music and aesthetic of Midwest emo. This manifests in several ways. Raw emotional delivery takes precedence over production quality. Audiences form through word of mouth rather than label promotion. And fashion was decidedly uninspired, favoring comfort and accessibility over artistic expression, which was largely relegated to the music itself. The melodies, the screamo, the twinkly guitars, Cap and Jazz had it all, and they were really the first band that put all of that together. You can listen to all of Cap and Jazz's music streaming with their compilation album. The way I would describe Midwest emo is you're all cozy inside, outside it's a crisp autumn day, you're all snuggled up and cozy, and you're just hoping that tomorrow is going to be a little bit better than the day before. What makes Midwest Emo and Emo stand out is the subject matter that's discussed in the lyrics. 
email stands out with its upfront expression of vulnerability and its ability to discuss serious topics like mental health and depression. Of course, other music genres do talk about those topics, but none of them are as synonymous with darker lyrics than emo is. And Midwest Emo took those songs and those lyrics and added melody to them so you could sing along to the songs. And now we have the answers to some of those questions. We know that Cap'n Jazz, for all intents and purposes, was the first Midwest Emo band. And we know what Midwest Emo is. Traditional Emo, but more melodic. But why the name Midwest Emo? Well, that one is actually pretty easy to answer. During the 90s, a lot of bands emerged with a more melodic sound. A lot of those bands came from the Midwest. So let's talk about those bands. When talking about important Midwest emo bands after Cap and Jazz, and honestly more important than Cap and Jazz, there's really only one band that we can talk about. Cap and Jazz included brothers Mike and Tim Kinsella. After the band broke up, Tim would leave his mark on emo with the band Joan of Arc, and Mike Kinsella would form the Midwest emo band, American Football. The Kinsella family tree is a very interesting part of emo history, and maybe that'll be its own video someday. American Football released their debut self-titled album in 1999, and emo was never the same. Even more than cap and jazz, no band is more synonymous with emo or Midwest emo than American Football. A lot of people would argue that Midwest Emo started when American Football released their debut album. It's just the most Midwest Emo, Midwest Emo album. It's a perfect album. What makes American football so important is their unique sound. They combine emo lyrics with music that was unlike anything else the scene was doing at the time. They replace the screamo with indie rock, math rock, and jazz. American football sounds like a crisp fall day. It sounds like a friend saying, it's going to be okay. American football's ability to mix emotional lyrics with a warm, soft sound is one of a kind, and the fact that the sound was accepted by the emo scene is pretty wild when you think about it, because again, it was so different from anything at the time. I don't use the word lightly, but American football are legends, and I can prove that. Nothing else sounded like this in 1999, and post-1999, anything that did sound like American football was put up against and compared to American football. There just was nothing else like it. The twinkly guitars that are so synonymous with Midwest emo do not exist without American football. When people complain about emo and they say it's just whiny lyrics about breakups, well, with this album, emo fans were allowed to say, well, you might be right about like, maybe like 85% of it, but hey, we also have this album that doesn't sound anything like that. And it's kind of crazy too when I was doing research and thinking about it that this album, the sound that this album has, was just adopted and embraced by a scene that has a lot of screamo, that is closely related to punk and hardcore and, and really aggressive sounding music, but we all heard this album and we're like, yeah, this, th this is ours. This is the thing that we can throw into the hat when people are like, okay, but what's like your most unique and best uh, record in your genre? Well, th this one, listen to this one. American football didn't really get their credit in 1999. It's always fun watching videos of American football performing and, you know, all of the American football songs are so slow and everything and the audience kind of doesn't really know what to do. They're just kind of you know, bobbing their head along. You know, maybe they wanted to, you know, come to a show and mosh and scream. Um, but, you know, you got American football. But with the emo and pop punk revival of the 2010s, American football did get their flowers, they reunited, and we got two new albums from the band. In addition to their music, which defined Midwest emo, American Football also gave us the American Football House. If Midwest emo had to be summed up in one image, it's this. This is the logo for Midwest Emo. The house is so important to Midwest Emo that Polyvinyl, the record label in Champaign, Illinois, which has put out pretty much everything from American football, they bought the actual American football house in 2023. 
That is just beautiful. I could talk about American football forever, but I have to move on so we can talk about other bands important to Midwest emo and its history. But sometimes I think we have all these legendary bands in the scene and from time to time we have to let them know just how important they are. I was just thinking about this too. Isn't American football just lo-fi? Like, isn't it the same thing? Slow, chill music that maybe you put on when you want to relax or study to, you know, something like that. Is American football emo lo-fi? Did American football invent lo-fi in 1999? Let's talk about the Get Up Kids. It's probably cliche to say that Something to Write Home About is a great album, but I'm still gonna say it. Something to Write Home About is a great Midwest emo album. It's a great emo album. It's a great pop punk album. It's a great rock album. When people talk about albums that are a 10 out of 10, Something to Write Home About is one of those albums. I mean, just look at the track list. Banger after banger after banger after banger after banger. And the Get Up Kids aren't just a one album band. 4 Minute Mile, the Red Letter Day EP, and even the band's last album, Problems, it's all good. I think Jimmy Eat World is either underrated or just properly rated. I think sometimes people forget that Jimmy Eat World are like the godfathers of modern emo. And I see you in the comments saying, Mike, Jimmy Eat World isn't Midwest emo, but clarity? If you listen to band interviews talking about Jimmy Eat World, bands from all across the alternative music scene praise Jimmy Eat World. Jimmy Eat World have so many anthems, so many popular songs, it wouldn't really do them justice for me to just rattle them off. They also have so many classic albums. They have such a powerful way to embrace vulnerability, and that has just resonated with fans worldwide. Almost more than any other band, Jimmy Eat World got into the mainstream. So that means a lot of people heard Midwest Emo, or just Emo, because of Jimmy Eat World. And again, I can hear you saying, yeah, but it's just the middle. But what's wrong with that? The middle is probably the most popular Midwest Emo song of all time. Sunny Day Real Estate is one of those bands that was a cult classic, but in recent years, they have gotten their flowers. Sunny Day Real Estate was initially known for having members William Goldsmith and Nate Mandela, who would eventually go on to play in Foo Fighters. As time has gone on, Sunny Day Real Estate has been recognized for their importance to Midwest emo, most importantly because Sunny Day Real Estate is from Seattle. So that's why we have the Sunny Day Real Estate rule that you don't have to be a band from the Midwest to be a Midwest emo band. The band's album, Diary, is considered by pretty much everyone to be one of the best emo albums of all time and one of the best rock albums of all time. Now, Braid, I do think, is pretty underrated in the grand scheme of emo. And remember that fun fact that we had earlier that the lead singer of Braid, Bob Nana, was in one of the first Midwest emo bands, Friction. Living in Chicago, Braid is always a constant when you're talking about which bands are underrated. Their album, Frame and Canvas, from 1998, is the album that you should listen to. Another fun fact is that after Braid broke up, members of the band formed Hey Mercedes, which is also a band that is always considered underrated. There's even rumors that people like Hey Mercedes more than Braid. One of my favorite Braid songs is Forever Got Shorter. It's a deep cut, but it's a good one. Now, let's talk about The Promise Ring. The Promise Ring are underrated. Their 1997 album, Nothing Feels Good, is one of the best examples of melodic emo ever. The album is so catchy, and it's just easy to listen to and sing along with. The early Midwest emo bands certainly left their mark, and one of the most defining things in Midwest emo are the lyrics. And would you look at that, that's our next stop on our Midwest emo road trip. Let's talk about the lyrics of Midwest Emo. Looking online, I saw a lot of comments saying that Midwest Emo and Emo as a whole, the lyrics are just about breakups, uh, reminiscing about high school, uh, being mad that you live in your small town, um, songs about loving someone who doesn't love you back. Does that sound familiar to you? Maybe it sounds like pop punk or punk rock or rock and roll or maybe music in general. 
Midwest emo kind of gets labeled the whiny cousin of the alternative music scene, but sometimes I think that overshadows the thought and emotion put in to some of these songs. So I wanted to highlight and talk about some Midwest emo lyrics that stand out to me. Let's start from the beginning. This is Oh Messy Life by Cap'n Jazz. You are bolder than buzzing bugs and colder than oldness could ever be. Oh, boy! Yeah! From Never Meant by American Football. Not to be overly dramatic, I just think it's best because you can't miss what you forget. So let's just pretend everything and anything between you and me was never meant. And uh, I gotta tell you, it was perfect. Braid with Forever Got Shorter, and if you have to choose, I'm gonna lose, I always do, we always do. Nice. Mineral with Parking Lots, but I know I've got to live my life and roll around on the ground and feel the strife and realize along the way that I'm nothing more than a grain of salt in the salt of the earth, and everything is grace. So come on with the darkness, come on with the fear, because I've got to start somewhere, and it might as well be here. <laughs> Another one from American Football. This is their song, I've Been Lost for So Long. If you find me, would you please remind me why I woke up today? I feel so sick, doctor. It hurts when I exist. This isn't the pain I'm usually in. I hope it's not contagious. Maybe I'm asleep and this is all a dream. I can't believe my life is happening to me. Don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. Eat the Snow by Glockamora. Listening to old Green Day records all by myself. Some favorite bands, a couple friends, and what it means to be 16 again. Jets to Brazil, Sweet Avenue. This song, the whole thing is great, so I'm going to jump around a bit. This day could someday be an anniversary. Thank you for making me see there's a life in me. It was dying to get out. Now all these tastes improve through the view that comes with you. Like they handed me my life for the first time. It felt worth it like I deserved it. What do you mean? <laughs> What do you what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? What is the Midwest emo aesthetic? Well, it's probably someone with a beanie, a flannel, a band tee, jeans, probably wearing vans. Hey! Wait a minute. Besides clothes, Midwest Emo, at least the meme version of Midwest Emo, has exploded on TikTok, and I make sure to always stop scrolling whenever I hear some loud dramatic monologue with twinkly guitars underneath. Then you know it's going to be a good one. I think my favorite is probably the girl asking her friend why she slept with her dad. That's a classic. You're out there on the West Coast in the sunshine with him. I'm in my car waiting for it to warm up. It gets dark at 3 p.m. I haven't seen the sun in four days. And on top of that, the cassette player in my 1995 Chevy Lumina doesn't even work anymore, so I can't even listen to the mixtape that I made for you. The Midwest emo aesthetic is pretty close to the emo aesthetic. You just got to throw in the Midwest in there, you know, sprinkle it in your album cover, maybe on a t-shirt design or lyrics. That works as well. And a lot of Midwest emo, the Midwest is actually a character. It's like a wide open, empty canvas for emotions to run wild. It wasn't just emo, pop punk, punk rock, hardcore, pretty much every alternative underground music genre had some sort of a revival in the 2010s. The rise of social media helped bands get their music out to connect with fans. Fans could then share their favorite music and connect with people who had similar musical tastes. The 2010s was just the perfect moment in time for the entire alternative rock music scene to expand. 
Midwest emo in the 2010s was very strong. Here's just a few notable bands from that time. Brave Little Abacus, Marietta, Algernon Cadwallader, Everyone Everywhere, Snowing, Title Fight, You Blew It, The Hotel Year, Glockamora, Charmer, The World is a Beautiful Place and I'm No Longer Afraid to Die, Camping in Alaska. Again, that's just to name a few. All of these bands approached Midwest emo in different ways. Algernon Cadwallader modernized the cap and jazz sound. Title Fight added in some hardcore, similar to what Lifetime did. The World is a Beautiful Place and I'm No Longer Afraid to Die went in a kind of post-rock direction, really experimenting with different sounds. And a band like Oso oh Oso oh so brought a chill summer vibe that reminded me of The Promise Ring. There's one band that I didn't mention that I wanted to talk a little bit more in depth on. You probably already left a comment saying, why haven't you talked about this band? Yes, I'm of course talking about Modern Baseball. I've talked about it on the channel before, but with the 2010s emo slash pop punk revival, I can talk about that time period firsthand because I was in high school and college during that time. So I was getting into all this music. I was going to all the shows. I was involved in all the online discourse at the time. You know, my world was about all this music. Some people might disagree with me. While Modern Baseball was definitely a popular band during the 2010s, I feel like the aura and popularity of the band has really only increased since they broke up or went on hiatus. A lot of bands from the 2010s revival are still making great music. Some bands, of course, broke up and never came back, but no band has such a fan base begging them to reunite more than modern baseball. I see it all the time in YouTube comments, on subreddits, Twitter. It seems like everyone wants modern baseball back. And yes, I'm aware members of Modern Baseball formed Slaughter Beach Dog, but that has not stopped fans asking for a modern baseball reunion. I went back and listened to the band, and yeah, everything pretty much holds up. It's as catchy as I remember, and this might be a wild comparison to make, but in the same way that I think Jimmy Eat World just got their fans and connected with them so much, I think the same thing happened for Modern Baseball. I mean, something as simple as referencing social media, Twitter, or Instagram in their songs made it just that much easier for fans to connect with Modern Baseball. We were all learning and figuring out social media really together during that time period. I mean, we were all liking our crushes photos on Instagram and we were all spending our evenings talking to Chloe on Twitter. Social media was growing and expanding during that time. So we were all analyzing vague Facebook statuses about relationships and modern baseball was our soundtrack. And if we look at modern dating and relationships and sliding into the DMs, modern baseball could almost be looked at as pioneers for adding the digital world into their lyrics, as far as one of the first bands to do that in the emo scene and really in a broader sense, the rock scene. Uh, a great band, a great modern band that does that is Future Teens. I will never forget reading a review of a modern baseball album, and I can't remember which one, but the uh, writer or the critic was just saying that, you know, modern baseball references social media too much, it's just a fad, it'll never last, and here we are. All of that to say, if a modern baseball reunion ever happens, I will be there. Also, one more thing, The Waterboy Returns is one of the best modern baseball songs. Fight me in the comments. Along with the surge in new bands, the popularity of emo in the 2010s led to older bands reuniting. Not only did we get an American football reunion, we got two new albums from the band. And also, legendary emo band Sunny Day Real Estate even came back. Also, it's time to acknowledge that Uncomfortably Numb is one of the best American football songs. I didn't really know where to put this, so I'm going to put this section right here. There are so many great underrated emo bands, Midwest emo bands, so I'm going to talk about them right here. Please be nice in the comments if I forget a really, really obvious one. Pogo, Slingshot Dakota, Kitty Hawk, go listen to their song Welcome Home. Rainer Maria, I Hate Myself, Colossal, go listen to their song The Serious Kind. Ashes, if you like emo more on the hardcore side. Fuel, and yeah, I know there's a lot of bands out there named Fuel, but what you're looking for is the emo band, so just go search Monuments to Excess and they should pop up. Uh, it's a little bit emo, a little bit punk, but regardless, they're pretty underrated. Angels in the Architecture, 238, Branston Park, and Joie de Vivre. If you like American football, you have to check them out. 
that should be enough to keep you occupied for a while. I know it's hard to listen to new music. I'm guilty of listening to the same 20 songs since high school too, but there is so much great new music being released every week. I did a lot of research. I went into every subreddit, every deep dark forum, every website on the internet to find the best and most obscure Midwest emo bands playing music today. Mauv, their album, Something About the Weather, was one of the best emo albums of 2023. Agi the Idol Opus is an amazingly beautiful concept album. Origami Angel keeps reinventing their sound, and I love their newest album, The Brightest Days. A Closure, Mom Jeans, which are pretty much the template for every single Midwest emo meme. Uh, Max Seal, Oso oh Oso, oh Short Fictions, Hot Mulligan, Home Is Where, a band that is straight out of the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, Palette Knife, Mr. Princess, Pool Kids, Saturdays at Your Place, Celebration Guns, Charmer, Future Teens, and Glass Beach. Hopefully, this list will also keep you occupied. Feel free to leave your favorite bands in the comments as well. I hope it's been obvious that a lot of what I've been talking about has been in fun. I do not want to gatekeep the label Midwest Emo or Emo. Uh, being a touring band and making a profit is hard enough. If any band uh, on the planet wants to label themselves Midwest Emo, Emo, Screamo, Pop Punk, whatever label, and it you know helps them uh, afford to stay in a hotel or, or pay rent or you know uh, live, uh, then I'm all for it. Uh, gatekeeping, especially music labels, is just so dumb, um, in my opinion. The emo and you know pop punk and punk rock scenes are so small in the grand scheme of things. Uh, we really shouldn't be uh, fighting uh, with each other, right? We all love uh, the same music. So I just wanted to put this in in the video as well. That I hope it's been pretty obvious that a lot of this stuff is a joke. Um, what isn't a joke because I feel like someone's going to call me out on it is, uh, the Midwest, Midwest team the American football cassette, uh, is a real, uh, cassette. I didn't want anybody yelling at me in the comments. Um, and all things considered listening to American football on cassette, it is pretty emo. Midwest Emo is in a great place. A lot of bands are experimenting with different sounds, but the tried and true formula of Midwest Emo is still out there and still has its fans. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and share the video. Subscribe if you haven't. Tell all your friends. Check out the other videos on... Hold on. This video is not over. Did you forget about someone? I'm gonna end this video the only way that I know how. You know the emo copy pasta, real emo, only consists of blah blah blah? No, that's not the only copy pasta. This is the Midwest emo copy pasta. Real Midwest emo only consists of the Chicago emo scene and the late 90s screamo scene. What is known by twinkly emo is nothing but math rock with questionable real Midwest emo influence. When people try to say that Hot Mulligan isn't real Midwest emo, but say that Sunny Day Real Estate is, I can't help but cringe because Sunny Day Real Estate is as fake Midwest emo as Hot Mulligan. Plus, Sunny Day Real Estate isn't even from the Midwest. Real Midwest emo is energetic, powerful, and somewhat jazzy. Fake Midwest emo is weak, filled with self-pity, and a failed attempt to direct emotion into music. Some examples of fake Midwest emo bands are the Get Up Kids, Promise Ring, and Algernon Cadawalla Darrier. Midwest emo belongs to screamo, not pop punk, alt rock, or any other mainstream genre. <laughs> okay, I think we're done. I think that's enough.